ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to ASPE for um, an evening with Mike Pizzullo, as we called it, Secretary of the Department of uh, Immigration and Border Protection. Uh, Mike is going to talk to us on strategy, conjecture and evidence this evening, which is a, uh, a fantastically uh, interesting topic to conjure on. Um, Mike, I want to thank you for the sponsorship, which you and your department have provided us here um, at ASPE. It's important to our work and I'd like to acknowledge Lynn and your son Sam who's come to um, grade your homework um, <laughs> as you speak to us this evening. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I, I think most people here will, will know of Mike's career. I don't intend to uh, go through it in detail. Uh, extensive experience in defence, uh, extensive experience working as a senior advisor in Parliament House to uh, Gareth Evans and Kim Beasley, a well-known figure in the Canberra environment. Uh, and I think the best thing to do is uh, immediately give Mike the floor. So can you please welcome Mike Pizzullo. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Peter. I'd like to uh, commence this evening by, uh, first of all, thanking you for the opportunity to uh, address uh, this distinguished audience this evening. and. Uh, Peter, for uh, as most people in this room would probably know, was my very distinguished successor at Defence and did a far better job uh, than his predecessor. I'd like to uh, also acknowledge a predecessor of mine, Paul Dibb. Uh, great, great to see you in the audience, Paul. Um, I, I said to Paul, I gave him confidence before to say that he is named in this uh, in these remarks, but not shamed. Uh, and I'm. And I'm honoured uh, uh, also by the presence of the Chief of the Army, uh, Angus, in your very bus busy schedule. I'm very genuinely touched and honoured by your presence uh, here this evening. And of course, uh, it'd be remiss of me to not say hello and and, um, and welcome to my darling wife, Lynn, and my son, Sam, who uh, will be grading uh, Dad's work this evening, I'm sure. Um, my uh, talk tonight, uh, just the refined title of which is Strategy, Questions of Method, uh, is deliberately intended intended to be quite dry and very theoretical. I know that there are members of the uh, press here and welcome to uh, you. And if you manage to jag a story out of tonight's remarks, uh, you are very, very talented indeed. <laughs> um, I will focus this evening on questions of method in relation to national security policy making and strategy. And if you think that what you hear this evening represents a prescription from me on any matter of actual policy, you have obviously misunderstood me. Policy making and strategy do not lend themselves, in my view, to the application of deep historical perspective, explicit philosophical frameworks, or coherent strategic concepts. Its practitioners have a necessary bias towards pragmatic action, as the aim of policy and strategy is to secure objectives through action. Historical perspective, philosophical frameworks, and strategic con concepts are, however, the very things which are required to help us to navigate the tangle of events, risks and trends that we perceive often dimly as we peer into the clouded haze of strategic uncertainty that is the future. Effective policy making and strategic practice should generate properly evaluated courses of action to deal with the clouded haze of the future and best practice and process here assists us to avoid reckless action on the one hand or paralysis and strategic immobility on the other. Now, it is often said that policy has to be evidence-based, for instance, relying on experimentation, survey and research, while, it, while at the same time avoiding the impression that this process is like the discovery method of the natural sciences. But policy, of course, involves a constant play of vision, values, imagination and normative assumptions, which in our system ultimately have to be resolved through the democratic process. Now, policy and strategy in the external domain is quite different from policy and strategy in the domestic policy domain. Not completely dichotomously different, but sufficiently materially different to make this following observation. In areas such as immigration, which of course uh, is my day job, health, education, aged care, taxation and the like, you find policy areas which lend themselves to the evidence-based policy-making model of which I referred e earlier. Now, yes, values and ideology, of course, play their parts, but the levers here are quite different. They're more readily to hand in the relatively structured system of the nation-state. External policy and strategy, however, require statecraft, 
Yes, evidence does exist in the form of intelligence and open source reporting. Uh, analysis by think tanks, and I acknowledge, of course, the fact that I'm in one uh, this evening, ASPE, who just today have produced an excellent report on uh, the rise of Mexican drug cartels and their influence on Australian society and security and other forms of academic research. But it is not as though we can readily run it uh, by way of a trial, an evidence-based approach, for instance, to freedom of navigation operations in the South China Sea, perhaps hoping that no one will notice while the trial is run tested and evaluated. I draw uh, for these following insights principally on Niall Ferguson's excellent uh, first volume of his Kissinger biography, uh, if you're interested, uh, Kissinger 1923 to 1968, The Idealist. This deals with uh, the period of Kissinger's career prior to his appointment as the National Security Advisor to Nixon after the 68 election. Kissinger, through his work uh, as a scholar in the 50s and 60s, had come to judge that the operation of the US policy machine had, was absorbing far too much senior executive attention and energy. Decisions were avoided and, until they appeared as conflicts within the interagency process, which then called for urgent action and the establishment of consensus, in an, often in an environment of hardened institutional positions. Senior executives, he found, did not spend enough time in policy planning, which necessarily involved conjecture about the future and the, and the consideration of hypothetical cases, essentially what-if exercises. And at the time, in the 1950s and 60s, he was particularly focused on the evolution of the doctrine that we today call mutually assured destruction, the flexible use of nuclear weapons and the role of conventional forces in a nuclear era. He relied on conjecture which he said is central to the practice of policy making and strategy, an ability to project beyond what is known with very little to guide policymakers other than their convictions, their historical perspective and the strategic concepts that they bring to bear. For Kissinger, what he called the spirit of policy following uh, the Hegelian use of the term spirit in this sense and that of bureaucracy were diametrically opposed insofar as the essence of policy is contingency it is, self, it is historically self-aware. It realises that it's part of a historical process. Whereas that of bureaucracy, to use Kissinger's phrase, is its quest for closure and certainty, often without historical reference point. Absent a coherent framework and a sense of historical context and consequence, activity in this realm can be sometimes mistaken for meaningful action, he said. An orderly pr procedure should be seen not as a chief purpose of government, but its indispensable aid. From his work, we can derive the following insights. Policy making and strategy are based upon a series of often unexamined assumptions, which tend to be so axiomatic that they are not thought to be worth stating or examining critically. However, in my contention, following Kissinger's work before he became National Security Advisor, we must constantly ask ourselves these questions. Are the structural features of an international system, of the international sy system, and the deep historical forces, expression, expressions of which are often embedded as unspoken influences in our strategic discourse, are they changing in ways which render those axiomatic assumptions invalid? The policymaker and the strategist has to be self aware, critically attuned, historically minded and not slaves, if I can paraphrase another great scholar, Keynes, to defunct thinking. Now, there's a paradox here in that often those who, notwithstanding their enthusiasm, their professionalism and often very high intellect, those who have the time and responsibility to examine an issue in detail are not always necessarily equipped by temperament, experience or worldview to engage in exercises of conjecture, risk calculation and, and options formation which present real alternatives for decision makers to consider. Often, the options generated through the staff process simply involve recommendations to engage in further observation of the problem at hand, more research, more staff work and more meetings. Conversely, those charged with making decisions or advising them directly and who have to balance interests, calculate risks and rewards, judge the legitimacy of action and the likely efficacy of the employment of national power, these are all elements of statecraft, are often not graced with the time and the space to reflect meaningfully on these questions. We're just simply too busy. We need to ensure, in my view, that there's a closer alignment between the staff process, 
which has the benefit of time and space, and the decision process, which often does not. My inclination, in fact, is to, tr is to trust staff officers to range more widely and to mentor them in terms of how to do this best, to encourage what-if thinking and exercises, for example, through scenario-based planning and red teaming work, to empower the staff process and to render it safe for such conjecture work. We should st stress test the assumptions of policy and strategy. We should look at low likelihood but high consequence events. Policy is not just simply a recitation of talking points, nor is strategy lurching from meeting to meeting without a clear sense of purpose and without clear engagement with the historical process of which you are a part, whether you like it or not and whether you recognise it or not. It is important in the staff process to avoid risk aversion by punishing non-conformity in terms of career incentives and disincentives. Let me momentarily dig digress in terms of uh, my own lived experience as the Deputy Secretary of Defence between 2006 and 2009. There was, a, there was an inevitable focus on matters to do with operations in Iraq, Afghanistan and East Timor. I was part of that process, necessarily so. But while today it is commonplace to focus on maritime strategy and naval modernisation with, with a justifiable, justifiable and welcome focus today on program management and project delivery, it was not commonplace then. Many, in fact, were keen to reorientate defence strategy and force structure towards counterinsurgency and land warfare, especially in the Middle East. The white paper process in 2009, in fact, had to challenge many con <laughs> contemporary orthodoxies on the basis of conjecture and calculus around strategic risk. The result was the defence white paper of 2009, of which I was the principal author and the lead public servant in terms of coordinating its preparation. It, it represented a very significant return to strategic geography as the basis for defence planning and force structure, but with quite different assumptions about the prospects of major power conflict and the nature of Defence of Australia contingencies, as they were called, in comparison with the white paper that Paul Dibb put together in 1987. In my view, of course I would say this, the calculus was well judged, and but of course should be tested, perhaps something that we'll do on the 10th anniversary of that uh, white paper. And I have to acknowledge, of course, that the thinking in that white paper is subsequently further evolved in two subsequent white papers, one brought down by a Labor government and one brought down by the Turnbull Coalition government, and especially in the Defence White Paper 2016, which, uh, in a very welcome way, dealt with program funding and the delivery gap that had, that had emerged in relation to the force structure. Let me turn to one of the central conceptual frameworks that I believe a strategist needs to employ, geostrategy. This isn't just about atlases and globes, although I have to disclose that these fascinated me from a very young age and I was always poring over atlases and globes uh, wherever I could find them. From a relatively young age, I, I, I um, uh, immersed myself in the works of Alfred Mahan and his work on sea power and the command of the oceans. Uh, Halford uh, Mackinder, who of course wrote about the geography of the heartland of Eurasia. And Nicholas Spikeman, a, a long forgotten, a now forgotten American strategist of the 1940s, who built on McKinder's thinking in terms of the Rimland theory of peripheral power around uh, Eurasia and implications for US grand strategy. Hardly ever anyone uh, quotes these works or indeed uh, reads them, uh, although I've had the benefit of um, uh, forcing myself in terms of disciplining my time in preparation for tonight's lecture to reread a number of their works, uh, including. Uh, copies uh, that I've had for many, many years. The three, these three uh, gentlemen, geostrategists uh, with very different uh, starting assumptions, all came to the view that land powers isolated from the sea in, in Eurasia were set in an ongoing struggle with maritime powers that sat outside of Eurasia. When I was growing up as a teenager, reading these works, um, I had a very uh, boring uh, teenage uh, period, I can assure you, uh, in the 1970s, the world, in fact, felt like a geostrategic place. Uh, there were geostrategic blocks. Of course, the Soviet Union still existed. There was the Cold War. There was what we today uh, have long have perhaps forgotten, but in those days we were very alert to the central balance of power. There were proxy wars in Indochina, Southern Africa and the Middle East, including in Syria in 1973 that almost led to superpower conflict. And, of course, then the emergence of detente. 
The Soviet Union, we know now, but perhaps didn't fully recognise then, was an incomplete superpower. That is indeed the title of Paul, Paul Dibb's masterpiece, uh, a book that he evolved from his PhD thesis into a book of that title. And Paul cast a very different intellectual framework over the evidence that he uh, ascertained for his PhD and engaged in conjecture about the sustainability of the Soviet model and the actual state of the central balance that underpinned the Cold War. Then, of course, in the 1990s, we saw the end of the Cold War. History, Fukuyama said, had ended, and geography seems to have lost, seemed to have lost its power, or so we thought. In this new global order, economics prevailed. Globalisation, of course, is an economist's paradigm, and a very useful one, a paradigm, of course, uh, not being a, a framework of false thinking, but a framework for organising information and perspective. But it is not a strategist paradigm. A strategist has to be concerned with the spatial distribution of power and the order thereby produced. In the post-Cold War epoch, the era of globalisation of the early 90s, we saw an expanding cooperative order of states who were observing common rules enmeshed in a growing collective economic system. Trade and capital investment flows were starting in earnest uh, after the fall of the Soviet Union. Trading services were booming. Technology transfer building of global supply chains truly across the globe, energy and resources linkages similarly, the emergence of global connectivity through the internet, and of course the explosion of global labour pools. All of these networks, flows and pools expanding across the sphere of the earth, limited, we thought, only by externalities and variable development tra trajectories, externalities such as sovereign risk and trade barriers. With this promise of prosperity was coupled with a promise of the forswearing, we thought, of war and conquest and the spread of democratic systems of governance. There was an emphasis on the notion of a global community and multilateral problem solving, cooperation regarding failed and fragile states, terrorism, disease, climate, resource scarcity, transnational crime, global financial imbalances. Underpinning this epoch, the post-Cold War epoch, was uncontested US primacy. Western philosophical ascendancy, a reduction indeed an elimination we thought of ideological conflict with the ascent of both democracy and the victory of the liberal capitalist system. We made an assumption that the tragedy of great power politics, to, uh, to quote the title of Mishheimer's landmark book of, 19, uh, of 2001, sorry, had somehow vanished. Great power politics had somehow vanished. And our evidence was this, for this, the integration of Russia and China into the global order, for instance, their ascension to the WTO, all very welcome developments. The world, we thought, was being filled in to the outer edges of the map, with the exception perhaps of some ungoverned spaces where Al-Qaeda, of course, was uh, germinating and breeding in the 1990s. Now, this view of the world, which is valid in many respects, is not grounded in geostrategy or the structural features, the deep structural features of the international system, or the historical evolution of the global order. Has geography really been negated? Has the world really been filled in? What if the 1990s model of the global order did not in fact represent the end stage of history? Of course, academic research more recently would suggest that US primacy is becoming more contested, that there's a re-emergence of ideological divergence, that there's a return of great power politics, it has a rather 19th century feel, the modern international environment. Not necessarily, and thank God, the decade of 1904 to 1914, but a 19th century feel none nonetheless, including the return of competition and the risk of con confrontation on the Eurasian periphery. Now, what if the Eurasian land powers, to quote or to reference those three geostrategists that I mentioned earlier, are in fact developing the economic and strategic leverage to take full advantage of their internal continental position. In the grand sweep of history since the 18th century, maritime powers, which tend to be liberal democracies with strong navies, first the British Empire, then the US, operating from its strategic citadel in the Americas, both with the mightiest navies that the world, respectively, in those two epochs had ever seen, contained land powers through hedging strategies which included coalitions with so-called rimland states. Um, there I'm referring specifically to Spikeman's, Spikeman's use of the term rimland. Engaging in confrontation and war only as a last resort. In the Napoleonic Wars, 
hedging and containing through the long peace of Europe between 1815 and 1914, and then, of course, having to intervene in, uh, uh, in the Eurasian strategic system in the First and Second World Wars and then separately the Cold War. Now, what about now if Eurasian land powers are using geo-economic power to create a continental trade and investment and transporta transportation and infrastructure system linked to new supply chains, new resource and energy chains, often tracing ancient trading routes? They're using sovereign wealth funds and state-owned enterprises to underpin their strategic plans, girded by maritime trading links and port access and investment agreements, building their strategic presence, including militarily engaging in fleet building and maritime projection beyond the Eurasian littoral across potentially vulnerable sea lines of communication and engaging with those rimland states through partnerships and or strategies aimed at achieving at the very least their acquiescence. What about if this, in this era the land powers are challenging the maritime states and resisting the rules and imperatives of the global order? This changes the strategic calculus for all actors. Are we seeing the emergence of, to use, to quote Mackinder's phrase, the heartland coalition, whereby the resources and capacity of continental Eurasian powers are combined for the first time in global history with oceanic power projection and presence? This surely would be the most consequential geostrategic and therefore geopolitical question of the age. Now, is this a bad thing? Continental power dynamics have since Napoleon's days, as, as I've posited earlier, pose a central question of central challenges rather of global order, with the power relationships in the Eurasian strategic system playing themselves out internally, as well as in reaction to the maritime based power interventions of first the British Empire and then the US. And we experienced a bloody century of conflict as a result. Perhaps the unifying tendencies of seaborne trade and the freedom of navigation at sea opens states to ideas, to innovation, to capital, to the movement of people and democratic practices. Perhaps all that went wrong in the last uh, decade of the last century was calling the end of history too early. Perhaps we called it a century or two too early. Perhaps what we are witnessing is the long birthing period of the end of, of, the end of history that Fukuyama spoke about. Let me quickly turn and briefly turn then to history. So I've dealt with geography, which is about space. Now let's deal with history, which is about time. History looks all orderly, but only in retrospect, when you know the ending before the beginning that could have been known to the historical actors. Revolutionary moments or periods of significant discontinuity appear to contemporaries as a series of unrelated upheavals or events, but the headlines of the day are always expressions and symptoms, symptoms of deep-seated historical forces and structural factors whereby the stresses of those various forces work against each other and cause fault lines to come apart. Let's look back a century to 1917, 100 years ago this year. Have we really seen the orderly playing out of historical forces according to some preordained plan? Think of what was happening 100 years ago. The First World War was approaching its denouement. The Bolshevik Revolution, uh, soon to have its 100th uh, anniversary, and the spread of communism was just coming into view. Following that, the rise of the far right and fascism, the Treaty of Versailles, and the and the result and the connected failure of the Wilsonian vision and the League of Nations, the Second World War, the Cold War of which I've spoken, the fall then of the Soviet Union and the end of the Cold War and the purported end of history that I've mentioned, and since that period of the early 90s, the return of geostrategic realities and great power dynamics all in 100 years. We can only ponder this evening what the world would look like on the 11th of July, 2117, when a baby girl born tonight will be celebrating her 100th birthday. As she looks back on her 100th birthday, what will the story of her century, 2017 to 2117, look like? I hope it's better than the picture that we look back on. Let me, find, let me finish these remarks then by pulling some of these strands together and examine the role of agency in history. What we think of as the international rules-based order that I've touched on is itself historically rooted and it's the outcome of agency in the face of the contingencies in this, in this instance of the late 1940s after the Second World War. When the US for the first time decided to entrench its forward, its forward presence around Eurasia, 
faced with an existential threat from the mightiest land power that a maritime power had ever faced. That, that, and this was before the Soviet Union had acquired its nuclear weapons in the 1950s. It decided very consciously to embark on, a pattern, on, a, a, on building a pattern of alliances with Rumland powers. It had decided that this was less than the cost of likely future interventions, the Second and First, uh, the first and Second World Wars being, being the bloody manif- manifestations of those interventions. Go back and read Nicholas Spike, Spikeman's book of 1942, America's Strategy in World Politics, and you'll find the blueprint for what everything that transpired after 1946 in terms of American strategy. It started, of course, with Churchill's Iron, Iron Curtain speech in 46 in Missouri. And the Truman document, uh, Doctrine, articulated in 1947, the building of the NATO alliance, which went far beyond a minimalist position which would have involved the US simply establishing with the UK a forward operating base and closing the Greenland, Iceland, UK gap to Soviet naval penetration into the Atlantic. They went far beyond that. They engaged in building peace with Japan and eventually an alliance. And you saw, of course, the emergence of the alliance system in Asia. You saw the maintenance of preponderant US naval power. They did not demobilise their navy after 1945 as they did in the 1920s. The world would look a very, very different place today if you didn't have a 300-ship US navy. We saw also the expansion of US capital investment and economic assistance, coupled with the internationalisation of US production. Global trade and investment systems were built almost from scratch with the Bretton Woods Institutional Agreements in 1944, the formation of the GATT, the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade in 47, and the announcement of the Marshall Plan to rebuild Europe in 48. This resulted in a global order, a rules-based international system that has had legitimacy for 70 years to the extent that it, that it has accorded with the interests of those in Europe and Maritime Asia who could have confidence that the order and its rules would be enforced by US primacy and power, especially its military posture, its alliances and its economic relationships. And the US has had to act as the indispensable nation in this system. Now, I've spoken uh, extensively this evening of structural factors and, and historic forces, historical forces, Um, And I've said that we don't often recognise the true world historical turning points and pivots. But I would instance, to go back to one of my earlier examples, the role of the individual in shaping and indeed bending history. And I produce as evidence for that contention the rise of Gorbachev in the late 1980s. His rise did reflect deep structural forces that were at play within the Soviet system, which were not necessarily readily apparent or comprehended within the strategic constructs and the paradigms of the time, notwithstanding the excellent work by Professor Dibb on the, inter- on the incomplete superpower thesis. None of these forces take away Gorbachev's agency, the choices that he made and the risks that he took. This evening I've mentioned a number of statesmen, Churchill, Truman, Marshall, Gorbachev, I would add Reagan. What is the role then of agency in this grand sweep of history, which seems to be, when you take a step back, dictated by these deep structural forces and stresses? Well, statecraft can shape history rather than being carried along by it. We're dealing here with with an eternal struggle between contingency on the one hand and inevitability on the other hand. There's interplace of the choices we make and the historical forces that we, that we confront. We make our own history, but not as we choose, and we're not free of the circumstances within, with, with which we are faced. The lesson I would contend of US policy in the late 1940s that I've touched on uh, this evening, which led to the establishment of the international rules-based order, or the US policy in, res- in response to Gorbachev's ascendancy and the, and the demise of the Soviet Union and the creation of the end of the Cold War period, which laid the foundations for the new order that I described earlier, shows one thing, that agency comes into its own at revolutionary points in history or at points of massive discontinuity. It's unusual for a serving Commonwealth Secretary to quote approvingly Vladimir Ilyich Lenin, but I will on this occasion. (laughs) Lenin famously said, there are decades when nothing happens and there are weeks when decades happen. In the space between the force of history, on the one hand, and the realm of choice, where women and men make the best choices that they can in circumstances which are never of their own making, 
and acting always without complete information. In that gap lies strategy. The task of the strategist and the policymaker who is advised by the strategist is to uncover the future, to take maximum advantage of opportunities or to mitigate risk and avoid future harm, or to exploit the weaknesses of, of an adversary or a competitor, or to act across a range of these objectives in various combination. The challenge is to grasp changing historical circumstances and to shape new and emerging trends to our will as best as we can. When we are confronted with profound structural changes in the international system and the global order, the essential elements are often in flux simultaneously and destabilising factors compound the adverse effects of all other factors. This is when statecraft of the highest order is required. An accurate and unvarnished appreciation of those historical forces and the structural problems of the international system in order to inform action. To quote another Kissinger reference approvingly, the title of his 1961 book on US foreign policy challenges, The Necessity for Choice. We have no choice other than to make choices, even the choice to do nothing. I'll conclude with uh, some observations, if I may, that attempt to pull these themes together, particularly regarding the relationship, as I see it, uh, between power, order, the rule of right and rules. Power is a function, as I've said this evening, of the structure of the international system and deep historical forces. These forces generate an order of express and implied balance of forces. In turn, this order generates legitimacy, again, in, in express or implied, as might needs to have an identified relationship with, white, uh, with right, without which others will seek to resist coercion, building their own alliances, partnerships and capabilities to counterbalance the coercive actor. And finally, legitimacy generates rules, the rules of the operating system which represent codified norms which connect back to power, because in the end, rules have to be enforced. Thank you so much for listening. was not as well spent as yours, uh, <laughs> uh, but I nevertheless see it as my, um, as my duty to try and uh, get you in trouble with the, the media, so I'm, I'm going to ask you <laughs> the first uh, question, if I can, which is to say, do you think that um, great shaping experiment of the American uh, post-war international order is now over? Um, I mean, we've seen a lot of commentary about um, essentially what's being described as the absence of leadership at the, at the G20. Um, and, and I guess what that means is that um, great changes in history can be made not simply by statesmen, but also by people who just kind of blunder onto the stage and don't really <laughs> know what's going on. Have we come to the end of that American uh, experiment of establishing global order? Well, you're inviting me to blunder onto the stage uh, in, a, in a manner that suggests that I don't know what I'm doing, so I'm going to avoid uh, that trap. Uh, no, tonight's address was uh, a very theoretical uh, address, uh, Peter, that has no contemporary relevance, uh, meaning or, uh, or interpretation that can be attached to it. Um, I, I will, say, uh, will say this, though, because um, uh, it wasn't, wasn't for these uh, fellows up the back with their notebooks scribbling away. Um, I, I, I could give you perhaps a, a slightly more candid uh, response, but I won't. Um, uh, they're just doing their job, so uh, and it's it's essential to our democracy that they do it. Um, what I would say is going back to the themes of my remarks. Um, what looks um, what looks in retrospect uh, almost heroic, almost um, of a superhuman character. Uh, one of the uh, elements I left out of my prepared remarks was I went back and uh, reread relevant sections of Thomas Carlyle's. Uh, work in the 1840s. He was, he was a great historian of the French Revolution and he developed um, what is today called quaintly the great man theory of history. So there's a gender problem there immediately. So there are no great women it seems. It's all about great men. But um, who would have guessed that that would have been the view in the 1840s? And he said exclusively, uh, don't worry about social forces. He acknowledged their existence. History is the heroic will and the expression of that heroic will through action of great men, and of course he wrote extensively about Napoleon, but then he went back and in other works uh, looked at um, 
uh, looked at other so-called great men. Now, there's lots of problems with that theory. A, there's the gender problem. Uh, B, as I said in my remarks, uh, yes, we do. men and women do make history, but not of their own, uh, not in a way that they choose. And that's another Marxist uh, quote for those of you who know your Marx. Um, so that's two tonight. And uh, three strikes, I think you're out of the Commonwealth Public Service. So, 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 don't, so don't invite me to quote Gramsci, because um, I can do that too. Um, so what looks, though, back in retrospect as heroic is contingent. If you go back and read, for instance, the personal papers uh, in the Churchill archives uh, of him browbeating as leader of the opposition in 1946, so he's lost the election, having won the war, the great man of Britain, to coin a phrase, he loses the election in 46. he's depressed. He sees the so-called Iron Curtain, that's a speech that famously made um, the Iron Curtain a popular uh, phrase that's known to most people. A and he feared that the Americans would demobilise and that his own country, led of course then by the Labor Party under Clem uh, Attlee, would pull back from the strategic role that they had traditionally had. These are contingent things, these are arguments. What looks back, when you look back and you think it's granite, it's, it's like it's inevitable. These are, uh, these are issues that play out through the actions of men and women as they go through history. And it's far too early to describe the history of this current period, Peter. <laughs> well, uh, now Marcus uh, kindly agreed to take a few questions. We'll go right here. Hi, my name's Happy. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak tonight. Pleasure. I'm just curious about your perspective as a strategist looking at 10, 20, 13, not 13, 30 years down the track and reconciling that with the government that currently seems to be making decisions that look at, you know, five, ten years at the future and best? How do you reconcile that and what can we do to improve that? Uh, well, first of all, see my previous answer to, to Peter's question. Um, again, what, what looks... When you look back, and both Peter and I are old enough to have experienced this phenomenon, you, um, if I may say, you don't look uh, uh, like you've got 30 years of, of professional experience and, and good luck to you. We are old enough to have 30 years of perspective back. Uh, and uh, yeah. Professor Dib, uh, we, we can add another decade or two. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, I'm sorry, it's just the, the things that you live through are never as heroic or indeed as disastrous as the subsequent history uh, ever suggests. Uh, and again, I'll just, I'll just go back to the events of 1945, 1946 and 1947, long forgotten, so we now talk about the international rules-based system as if it was, uh, it came down as tablets of stone. It was just simply uh, an in, a, a historical inevitability. People had finally figured out, let's stop fighting. Um, they didn't. It was an argument. It was contingent. Uh, uh, Churchill gave his famous speech in '46. Truman had uh, enormous challenges in terms of support to states facing Soviet coercion and the whole Truman Doctrine of 47 was about providing assistance to both Greece and Turkey to resist Soviet coercion. It's an argument and, and I just plead with everyone in the audience as someone who works very closely with ministers, uh, notwithstanding the great work done by our press, um, uh, but, but the, the notion that somehow we have um, uh, people who can't cope with, uh, don't have the same st stature as these heroes of the past, when you work up close and personal, you get a very, very different perspective. And I say that across uh, all party lines. Peter and I have, have worked for uh, parties of both, governments of both political persuasions. It's too early to write the history of the present. Now, Mike, I see Paul wants to ask you a question. I can ignore him if you'd like to. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just, Paul, want to just wait for the mic. Uh, I just want to make the third Communist Party quote for you. Uh, <laughs> as long as I don't do it, I'm not out of a job. So. <laughs> Trotsky, mm -hmm. you might not be interested in war. War is interested in you. And you write about great people and, and great women. You know, Elizabeth I, for instance. Um, with Gorbachev, if he hadn't have come on, uh, the Soviet Union could still be around. Think about that. It was a powerful country with powerful military forces and internal security. But we all got that one wrong, me included. Quick observation, and you might want to or not respond, and I'm not saying this because you're here, Mike. I spent the last two days on the 2009 white paper, 
Brab and I are writing a paper about the need for the expansion base and mobilization against much shorter term major contingencies than last year's white paper. Your white paper, 2009, for the first time talks about the use of force in international affairs, not to be used casually, but it is central to the concept of power. And you've got a brilliant section, which I think I sort of bypassed when it came out, on threats from major power adversaries. You're not Robinson Crusoe on that, Paul, so. And you actually talk about what would we do if there was a major power adversary in our northern approaches. And I'm quoting it at length because I think we're now in that situation. We could well be in that situation. This is not 1987 and all that stuff I wrote at all. Last year's white paper, which took three years, yours took how long? Uh, Six months? Uh, it wasn't quite that quick, no. Well, let's say a year. Well, I'm cheating, Paul, because I started writing it when I was about 15. So yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Anyway, the 2016 white paper doesn't talk about the use of military power in the same way at all, and certainly doesn't posit major power adversaries. Instead, it talks and mentions 54 times the rules-based international order, which, as you so quite wisely say in your speech, is in trouble. Is there anything you'd like to react to on that or nothing? Uh, well, um, a couple of, a couple of points. Uh, one, um, I should, uh, and I left this out of my prepared remarks, but... We did have the benefit, uh, and I've said this publicly before uh, in other addresses, including, I think, to Aspie, we had the benefit in 2007 of the then Minister Brendan Nelson, who was the Defence Minister, Prime Minister Howard had, had already decided before the November 07 election that saw the government defeated and um, the Rudd government elected, they'd already decided to do a major strategic reappraisal uh, of our defence uh, environment, of our, our strategic posture and our force structure. Uh, and so, as the Deputy uh, Secretary, we we're already assembling the relevant evidence, the intelligence reports uh, and the like, and starting to engage in the process of conjecture that, of, of which, I've, um, which I've referred to. Um, that's a cardinal sin, isn't it? I, I only had it on because I was expecting... Um, I do apologise. I, I was expecting a call from either Lynn or, or Sam saying, where are you? Um, <laughs> um, so we had a bit of a running start, uh, and Dr Nelson, who uh, uh, it's not often recalled um, these days, actually stated uh, with Mr Howard, I know's explicit endorsement, that they were going to do a white paper after the 2007 election. So issues like the rise of significant maritime-based military power in our region was already on our mind. Now, th none of that is to say at all that we were taking our eye off the conflicts. We had, we had soldiers dying. Uh, in, in, in theatre, and I recognise, of course, the presence of General Campbell here tonight. So we're very focused on near-term contingencies, actual combat operations, and, and, our, and our fighting forces needing support in the field. The question, I suppose, without um, going into every single um, uh, back alley of your question, uh, the question for us was, how do we deal with that reality, which is always going to, do, which is always going to attention, uh, uh, command attention? People are dying. We have alliances that, uh, that, are, that are in play. We have partnerships with our security partners, be they in East Timor, in Iraq or Afghanistan. How do we balance that with withdrawing a bit and, and f giving ourselves some very deliberate time and space to think about what does the world look like in 10, 15, 20 years' time? And we worked very hard at that. Uh, and as I said, had... I'm sure, I'm absolutely certain. In fact, I've had, I've had the benefit of a conversation with Mr Howard on this. Had the Howard government been returned, not to say they would have had the same white paper, but I, I think that would have been on their mind as well. So, um, so strong bipartisanship there. And then, of course, um, the rest is well-known history in terms of the white paper that Mr Rudd uh, directed uh, be produced. And Mr Fitzgibbon was the Defence Minister who oversaw its, its production. Um, Look, there's no point comparing white papers when you're a practitioner. We leave that to uh, our distinguished and esteemed colleagues at the at the ANU, uh, particularly those who those um, who are former deputy secretaries of strategy. That's your job, uh, Paul. So I'm going to be, I'm going to sound like a politician. You're the commentator. I'm not. Um, I, I will say though, if you look at the force structure, uh, and I reference here Mr. Turnbull's. Uh, uh, regular commentary on this. You look at the force structure, there's been a lot of stability in that force structure since 2007, 2008 and 2009. And the issue, in, and of course uh, I'm here to be completely studiously apolitical, so I'm not going to get into any partisan conflict, the government would say, so I'll represent their view, 
The issue was lack of delivery and lack of funding and lack of drive around program management and project delivery rather than a deep reappraisal of the strategic circumstances. So you draw those um, distinctions and, you know, they are textually there and anyone can read the text. But in terms of the continuity of the force structure, Australia's had a very stable view in bipartisan terms of force structure for the best part of a decade now. Mike, thinking on uh, one of the uh, areas of your speech, I'm, I'm conscious that um, you know, we, we are dealing with senior policy makers, both officials and, and politicians, who are incredibly busy, and that does crowd out um, what you might call strategic thinking time. Uh, do, do you think there's any... Is there a case to say we need to be doing things um, somewhat different in this town to support politicians differently, to give them more time, or, or is that just a sort of utopian fantasy about how, how we can shape those systems? Uh, the frank answer is um, we should be doing more, and partly going back to the uh, question asked of me uh, earlier, and I've, uh, like you, Peter, have worked for cabinets and national security committees of both political persuasions. Uh, that you have highly intelligent men and women who get a brief quickly, they, they're, they're skilled at getting to the essential key strategic point, and they have a hunger for advice, which is well-argued, well-constructed, well-evidenced, uh, often based on conjecture and hypothetical stress testing of, um, of, uh, of current thinking, current orthodoxies. The one thing that I found, and I'm sure you've found, and Paul and, and General Campbell have all found, is what um, ministers require, and I think absolutely this is part of our own sacred oath, is that they need the space to then think about those matters confidentially. So, so, so what you need to be careful about is this sort of overcorrection the other way, where the public service and the institutions around the public service, including the military forces and the intelligence agencies, uh, frankly become too promiscuous in, in how they talk about these things and too open, frankly, about how they talk about these things. It is for ministers in the end to deliberate on these matters, to take the advice in confidence. Uh, but I can um, instance many times in my mind, I'm sure you can as well, when, when ministers, contrary to the, all of the caricatures that is regrettably generated about them, and that's just part of our democratic discourse and you can't do anything about it, far from shirking hard news and not wanting to hear it, actively seek it out. They want to be told it, obviously in confidence, so they can then think about the balance of risk and rewards consider the different options, and then to go for the option that most accords with, in the end, the mandate they have, because they're ultimately going to be held accountable and responsible. Now, can we do things in the bureaucracy better to support them? Absolutely. Can think tanks do more by way of red teaming, scenario-based planning? Absolutely. But the nexus then to the decision process has to be very carefully managed, because in the end, uh, it is for ministers to get up and they have to explain decisions, including profound decisions like going to war or, or engaging in, in other forms of military operations, and they should be given, afforded the respect and the space in which to do that confidentially. Well said. Um, I'll take perhaps one last quick question if anyone would like to ask my question. Uh, yes, please. Yeah. Uh, evening, Secretary um, Tim Adams. Um, I just wanted to... Um, uh, expand on your comments about Fukuyama. You mentioned that um, he said that history ended when um, laissez-faire liberalism, capitalism and democracy defeated state socialism. Just wondering whether you had any thoughts about how you might give some advice to policy makers and strategic advisors in a more uh, diffuse, uh, less structured and a probably non-state actor um, type environment that we're existing in at the moment. Um, there's this um, uh, not, not surprising tendency in this room to try to drag me into the present and, uh, and worse, to try to get me to um, give some prognosis about the future, uh, which is very, very dangerous uh, for, the, um, for a secretary to do. Um, although I left enough breadcrumbs, hopefully, in, in my remarks, that, uh, you can work this out for yourself, but as soon as you've asked so nicely, I'll, I'll, I'll let you know. Um, I, I think it's a good thing that um, uh, what I described as Eurasian land powers uh, are opening up to the sea. I think it's a good thing that they're engaging in trade. I think that the idea that... I'll come to non-state actors briefly in a moment, but I think the idea that uh, Fukuyama 
and in the genius of his thesis, I mean, you know, it was sort of put together in, in an article in, in 89 and then refined subsequently in, in, in the book. It captured the zeitgeist absolutely. But if you go back and read it, and it's worth reading, um, this wasn't some policy pamphlet about what's going to happen in the next couple of years. It was a very deep, uh, a deeply thought piece and exposition on... He applied Hegelian dialectics and a whole lot of philosophical constructs that we don't have time to uh, discuss uh, tonight. Um, but, but his view was, in the dialectical process... Um, the essential model for how to ration scarcity and for how to lift people out of poverty, how to create burgeoning middle classes, and this was really before the, the explosion of the global supply chains, the global connectivity, the global flows of investment and the movement of people. Um, he said that that ideological struggle had been, had been concluded. I think he's right. I think what is a mystery, because I think it's, it's to be written in the future and perhaps the the young woman or the baby girl born tonight um, uh, will have a distinguished career over 100 years writing uh, these books and working out at what moment did the world come to self-consciousness and self-awareness of the fact that balancing democratic systems of governance with liberal capitalist modes of production and economic activity combined with the social wage and all the other things that you go back and find in Fukuyama's book that that is, through a dialectical process, the best that humanity is ever going to design. And then the question is, well, if it wasn't available in 1989 when he wrote the article, and it wasn't available in 1999, and you can just keep going forward, maybe the trick for not so much strategists necessarily but others is to pick in which decade does it potentially come to fruition. And that history has not yet been written. That's been my defence all night for not giving you relevant answers. Um, not uh, Non-state actors. Well, yes, power has become diffused and we tend to think of non-state actors as nefarious people, and often they are. Uh, Islamist terrorists, transnational uh, narcotics uh, cartels that often increasingly are actually spreading their techniques across many, di many different commodity types, in fact, forming a nexus with terrorism. And Aspie's doing a lot of good work in that regard. But there are other non-state actors, uh, billionaires who uh, come amongst us and say, actually, I think I can cure cancer or I can eradicate or at least work hard to eradicate malaria. Now, they haven't been sanctioned by the state, uh, but they are using their entrepreneurship, their, their access to capital, their networks to deal with problems that are typically, as economists would def define them, as public goods problems. So the rise of non-state actors in and of itself is a neutral phenomenon, as is the rise of the internet, as is the rise of connectivity, as is the rise of artificial intelligence and all the rest of it. It's the question of what, is, what purpose is applied to the employment of those tools. Uh, and so in and of itself, uh, yes, power has become diffused, but that actually, in my view, adds resilience to the system. It adds depth to the system. It helps us actually to manage risk rather than necessarily just being a source of of threat and heightened risk. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please stand by.